So let's begin so with Dabus. And this would give us the technology for what I'm going to say later. At the regular conference, I would be going first with introduction, but this is a computer science conference. So let's start, let's start with Steve's show. We have about 30 minutes for it. And then I will take over with uh, applications in uh, digital transformation. Thank you, Steve. We get, we get to start now. You well, thank Steve. you, uh, Baika, for the invitation to speak today. I'm going to be talking about DABIS, otherwise known as Device for the Autonomous Bootstrapping of Unified Sentience. Unfortunately, uh, what the world is hearing about Davis is the legal aspect uh, is a patent developed by a machine autonomously uh, deserving of a patent. So that's the worldwide debate going on right now. But this is an opportunity to talk about the technology and the science behind Davis, not really drilling down that deep, uh, which is impossible to do within a half hour. But you see a teaser view of a proof of principle experiment done way back in preparation for the patent. And what you see on uh, those four computer screens are four separate uh, models, neural models. They're being integrated together by uh, a camera that's looking at the scene uh, and then ba basically being filtered and processed on the other end. Uh, and of course, there's a TCP IP connection back to this cluster of machines that you see uh, on the left. So I'm essentially using uh, the screens, the LED monitors as a kind of pseudo cache and not, no longer are they for human benefit to see what's going on. Basically, they are involved in the computation, which is a paradigm shift in itself. Now, I'm going to go back quite a bit. This is probably kindergarten for a lot of people in the audience. But the brain uses two kinds of mechanisms for using neurotransmitters, uh, the first of which is synaptic transmission. And you're seeing this even in TV commercials now for new drugs. But essentially, a polarization wave comes in from the left. I'm referring to the left insert polarization wave comes down an axon and releases uh, neurotransmitters from uh, vesicles. They migrate a very short distance to receptors that in turn launch a secondary polarization wave. That's the usual state of affairs and probably what's being emulated in most of artificial neural network technology today. Volume neurotransmission involves the activity of whole colonies of neurons specialized in the wholesale release of neurotransmitters across the brain. And once these are introduced into the system, they permeate through, can penetrate into the synaptic cleft. And when they are claimed by these receptor sites, they too can launch a polarization wave. So even in the absence of any kind of environmental stimulus, uh, we can create the impression that something is going on out in the environment off to the left. So I called that uh, virtual input effect for a good reason way back in the early 90s. So that caught my attention, that whole uh, possibility of producing virtual inputs and began conducting experiments in the early 90s. And this is an exemplary one. Uh, we take a pre-trained multilayer perceptron, pin the inputs at constant values and begin to increase the number of these diffusing synaptic perturbations. And what I did was keep track of the rhythm of the, the turnover of patterns from the net uh, as a result. So as you can see, as you begin to increase the level of these stray molecules uh, in simulation, the turnover rate begins to increase almost linearly and then turns over completely and flat lines again out to zero. What's happening is the pattern turnover keeps increasing, but the ones that are actually faithful memories are beginning to decrease. And that's because of the failure of these neural networks to carry out pattern completion internally. 
So what we do is uh, what we obtain are one-off variations uh, near the peak of this curve. And after that, we begin to see uh, uh, two off, three off, and then utter nonsense out here off to the right. So if I begin to conduct this experiment with this network training, what happens is uh, we enter into this regime on the right that I call W, where a lot of ideas are forming, how should I say, subliminally. Uh, no one's noticing what's going on. But essentially, as we begin to decrease the internal perturbation level, uh, the network begins to spit back these ideas out in the W regime that are now um, made into intact memories. So the memories are then reviewed, the memories that are formed from ideas formed out in the W regime. So through this tidal variation, I can basically keep manufacturing new ideas uh, and the net can be manufacturing those ideas and then return back as memories as the net's uh, uh, synaptic perturbation level falls. So that was the inspiration for this uh, computer architecture, this neural network architecture that I patented back in 1994. It consists of at least two networks, one of which is a generator, the other is a discriminator or a critic, and each has the ability to um, trigger reinforcement learning within the other. So what results, uh, without going into great detail, essentially is a brainstorming session between these two nets in which ideas are generated, refined, and then selectively uh, strengthen within the imagination engine, as I call it. Uh, so it becomes an associative memory for new ideas. Does that work great? Uh, lots of commercial contracts back in the 90s utilizing this technology. Uh, a lot of newsworthy events also took place, uh, composition of music, new art, and so forth, generating those funny faces that you see so much of nowadays. But the problem is it could not be scaled up to 100 billion neurons easily. And the problem is, of course, if you've trained multilayer perceptrons, uh, the number of required weights goes as the square of the number of inputs. So you get a phenomenal number of weights required, phenomenal number of weights required down here in the lower net. So impractical uh, training times, impractical number of exemplars are needed. So I had to somehow linearize the problem, but I, I hope you can see that these are two networks basically in a competition. Sometimes they are working adversarially, sometimes they're working cooperatively, but the net result are new ideas. So the key to solving that problem with scaling was to linearize uh, the action of these nets and again, going back to kindergarten again, I basically use associative memories uh, taking the form of uh, auto-associative networks. And the way these work is we show patterns that are interrelated. So it could be many synonyms for word. It could be uh, many different pictures of dogs, making it a genre specialist for dogs, cats, uh, you name it, any kind of subject matter. And to find out if a pattern in the input pattern actually belongs to that conceptual space is to propagate it through. And I call it resonant when the regenerated, the reconstructed pattern uh, is very close to the input pattern. So the net produces a delta, uh, the Euclidean distance between the input and output patterns. And when delta goes to zero, the input pattern has actually found, tagged a, uh, a resident memory within the associative memory. And you can think of this as a very compact database that doesn't require careening through large amounts of data, but simply presenting a pattern and it basically responds by saying, yes, I know all about that. So Davis begins as an array of many of these associative memories and it is watching the environment. I'm speaking in general terms about the environment, excuse me. <coughs> and the environment sends patterns through constantly through this array. And 
if the environment presents a, an entity or an activity A, the corresponding associative memory response, it's resonating. If, it if the environment presents some entity or uh, some activity B, then the B associative memory response. So now here is where things really get interesting is if both A and B are presented simultaneously in the environment, then A responds, B responds, and they begin to wire themselves together. And to those of you deep into Donald Hebb's uh, theories, um, basically when neurons fire together, they wire together. In this case, when two associative memories resonate together, they tend to bind together. So this is the combination of uh, things occurring in the environment. There could be a juxtaposition of entities and or uh, activities. Then we can add more and more of these different uh, associative memories to the chain. And that results from introduction of perturbations into this net that's monitoring all the connections. Now, typically, if you're talking about artificial neural networks, voids are stored in tables. Here, they are stored within another network. So ironically, it is a network whose weights encode the weights within this larger system above. So what happens is if B and C alone have produced an effect, D and E, then uh, essentially it can now unite with A within this perturbed net. So now we see that the combination of uh, B and C results in a consequence, D and E, and by virtue of uh, displaying this uh, consequence, it reifies, basically it's made more concrete, more real by the fact that uh, yes, we now have an effect, a consequence. Uh, and in a sense that tends to classify whatever the thing A, B and C happen to be. Uh, well, it's the thing that does D and E. So I, I think that could be uh, you know, the preliminary classification of anything. Uh, and then culture, society basically says, well, D and E is basically this kind of a thing or that. Uh, so it comes up with a title for it, which can also be done too. Then we will actually see details about B's connection to A if A is a wheel, B is an axle, it might, F might qualify the relationship as axle penetrating wheel. Uh, and then we tend to get more exact. And I am speaking in uh, uh, generalities here. But now it's the perturbations within this weight storage net that actually brings about this ex extra detail to further reify the concept. Now, peppered peppering this whole array of associative memories are critical nets that contain very uh, impactful kinds of memories. And the best way of exemplifying that is in the newborn human infant. Uh, they come with factory installed memories, if you will, the courtesy uh, not of any mentor, but of Darwin. And those nets typically uh, store uh, the impactful memories of things like falling, of uh, hunger, thirst, satiation, warmth, uh, you know, both positive and negative effects on the host organism. So when finally the D, E, G chain tags the G, it triggers the release of neurotransmitters, the simulated neurotransmitters, the perturbations into the weight storage net. Uh, that can now induce learning. Turns out you can actually introduce a surplus of these perturbations and learning. There may also be uh, an excess of inhibitory uh, simulated neurotransmitters in the system, and basically the introduction of uh, excitatory connections, titrates. So you can neutralize excitatory, excitatory versus inhibitory uh, neurotransmitter simulations and arrive at a placid or tranquil state in which these networks can actually see each other's state and wire together by that generalized Hebbian principle. Um, and furthermore, there's recurrence because if you start a chain 
uh, due to the circulation, you're able to carry out pattern completion on these associative memories and complete thoughts uh, either faithfully or unfaithfully to produce whole new ideas. So here's what the system looks like. Bird's eye view, you've got multiple uh, chaining models running simultaneously and to make things relevant, these could be different sensory channels in the brain. This could be the, the visual channel, the auditory channel off to the right. Down below, we could have the uh, pressure sensitive uh, uh, brain pathway and here you could have the olfactory in the lower left. And when you have the dog present in the room, you basically have to take all these different impressions together, uh, the sight, the sound, the smell, um, the texture of the dog, and they're all integ integrated together by, via a camera uh, that can actually transfer highly compressed images of the original image and then pass it through a novelty filter, uh, usually a very fast uh, auto-associative neural network that filters out all but the most novel uh, of these patterns to detect uh, the new ideas. And then there's another system out here that can be neural networks or preferably just a simple detector that's looking at foveating the whole scene, looking for the resonance of the hot buttons within the, the whole uh, uh, array of these associative memories. And then this is able, the consequence map, the purple box is able to now inject uh, the simulated neurotransmitters into the system to either uh, trigger learning or to trigger the fragmentation of I previous ideas, mutate them, uh, uh, combine them into whole new ideas. And I typically call the camera, the novelty filter combination, uh, the thalamobot to emulate essentially thalamic function. So here is the, yeah, if I can, here's the original inspiration. It is inspired by biology, probably because of my hanging around the Neuroscience Institute in San Diego, uh, where we were talking about this actively. Um, Cortex, of course, uh, you know, 100 billion neurons approximately. And there are about 4,000 axonal connections to the thalamus. Um, and uh, there's still debate whether or not uh, different patches on the cortex correspond to certain patches on thalamic nuclei. But my addition to this whole theory is that the limbic system is triggered to inject or retract uh, these simulated neurotransmitters. So it's, it's not simply a conduit from the body to the cortex, it's basically a uh, recurrent loop uh, between thalamus and cortex. So not having the, the money to actually buy a supercomputer and uh, to implement uh, InfiniBand uh, high-speed serial transfer, what I did was improvise and found out it was better than InfiniBand and some of the high-performance computing techniques. Uh, the cortical model was simulated through uh, optical displays. And you know, speaking generally, they could be anything from the uh, computer monitors that you saw in that first slide to whole optical neural networks. But we're seeing the chaining models at work. Camera integrates everything together within its frustrum here, as you can see in the dotted lines, and then produces a very compressed image of the cortical model which is, are these separate models, thus the uh, uh, unification that's going on of multiple models running in parallel. Uh, those are passed through the novelty filter and essentially the, the more interesting novel thoughts are, or patterns are then uh, detected and then appropriately the right uh, neurotransmitter is injected. <coughs> Excuse me. So that turned out to be faster than any high-speed computer technique simply because we're not transferring bytes and bits anymore. We're transferring shapes, topologies. Um, 
the whole language has changed and we're getting faster than InfiniBand for transfer. And besides, this is a sparse representation. We don't need to have all the states of all the bytes in the system. We simply need to transfer the shapes. So you know, the example I use uh, is, well, the silhouette of Mickey Mouse is recognizable in 10 megabytes as well as in a few kilobytes. And that's what's happening here. There's a compaction process going on. <laughs> and I can still hear Paul Werbo saying, well, how does the cortex summarize what it's thinking within the thalamus? And I think this is the answer to how that happens. Now, here's an example of how we use that anomaly filter or, or novelty detector. Here's about 10,000 of these resonant associative memories on the left. And on the right, you see the filtered view. So humans can't really tell what's going on. But here you see, if you can look closely, I don't know if you've got the resolution on your ends, but um, you are forming chains. They're not too visible, but here is the filtered view. And you can plainly see that. Now, this is not a generative exercise, it's more monitoring an environment. You might be able to think, uh, you might be able to figure out what's going on here, but essentially we have four cortical models running simultaneously. And not only do you see the chaining topologies, but you actually see the timestamps. You can actually see them activating and then relaxing uh, as these snakes form and dissolve. So what's happening is we are now classifying the snakes as opposed to individual neuron activations, even though those individual neuron activations are work guiding the evolution of these different uh, topologies. So compression is going on throughout the system. Whole conceptual spaces are compressed into associative memories, as you saw. Uh, those concepts and strategies are now represented as shapes formed by linked associative memories, no longer bits and bytes are being transferred. So the shapes are, are being employed. Um, there's an analog geometric compression of shapes simply by looking at uh, multiple displays and essentially combining them into one small display. And of course, once you filter that for novelty, you can now compress it even further using JPEG compression and essentially form out that image to multiple machines at the same time over a LAN. And then the search is really streamlined um, because you're not looking for you know, large change. You're looking basically for those chains leading to a hot button or a hot button alone resonating. So it can look at fixed receptive fields. It can foveate all over the display looking for these hot buttons. Uh, and the anomaly filtering tends to uh, make things less confusing because you're not looking at the overlay of multiple uh, chaining patterns. You're looking at the most recent. And then you can also use audio clues to uh, zoom in on the thoughts. So overall, there's a lot of compression going on and that's what makes this so powerful. So a bit philosophical, uh, but uh, Davis can essentially emulate all aspects of cognition. There's perception. We're in these uh, to topological chains basically emulate the environment rather than on-off patterns of neurons. They're whole conceptual spaces linking up into ideas. Uh, and then thought as we now inject the equivalent of serotonin and uh, cortical adrenaline into the system, probably a host of other neurotransmitters. But essentially, uh, these shapes begin to consolidate, strengthen, some tend to fragment, break apart. Uh, but the result is a succession of states, especially with the uh, recurrence and the feedback between uh, the cortical models and the uh, thalamobot. And then feeling, you know, it's like the, the, the sentience is not a mystery for me because sentience has to be composed of members. Uh, the memory is basically contained in these associative memories. So something is observed in the environment. We see the consequences of it in terms of chains and so forth. But again, if nothing else is occurring. It's like, you know, all, all of matter is composed of different atoms, um, hundreds of them. 
Uh, but nevertheless, we don't need to look further. They're, they are simply memories. But there's a general feeling now as we suffuse the entire system now with these neurotransmitters, call it the buzz of consciousness, but uh, that's the unexplainable part uh, in which you are globally infiltrating the entire system and producing, uh, first of all, a different rate of pattern turnover. Uh, if it's low, it's basically uh, uh, slow and linear. And if it's if it's an excess of neurotransmitters, then we're talking about fast and chaotic. So other neural networks can interpret that and say, hey, uh, there's something catastrophic going on. Or no, we're in a period of tranquility. So call it uh, machine sentience, if you will. So if you're curious, we have put this whole thing to, to use over the years. Uh, art, you know, you're seeing that, uh, uh, that one piece of uh, work called uh, A Recent Entrance to Paradise, and uh, that was generated in 2012, and that's led to the copyright dilemma. Music, you know, Song of the Neurons, a whole album composed spontaneously uh, and uh, autonomously by a Davis system. Um, uh, some people like it, some don't, but I guess, I guess that's the story for any kind of music. Uh, the invention 2018 is putting together a Davis system as a uh, basically a laboratory for studying machine consciousness and sentience. And they said, can you invent something with it? And I said, well, yeah. Uh, I, not only can I do that, but it's not going to be the usual uh, parametric optimization that we're used to thinking about with generative neural networks. We can actually conceive. So in the matter of toothbrushes, for instance, uh, you know, uh, Davis uh, was responsible for a cross-action toothbrush way back in the mid-90s. Um, but that was a parametric optimization. You know, how long should the bristles be? How should they be spaced? What should their stiffness be? But this is more akin to the original invention of the toothbrush when the Chinese basically took a bamboo stick, stuck hog whiskers in it, and aha, that was a way of reaching to the teeth and brushing off uh, uh, excess food and reducing uh, bacterial concentration and tooth decay. Um, of course, investors want to make money, so stock market modeling is something that we're involved in right now, and so far we're beating all the hedge funds on paper, so that's led to more development recently. Uh, medical applications, you're going to be seeing something in the news shortly, um, but I think what we have here from a scientific perspective is a form of sentient artificial general intelligence, and now it's simply a matter of adding money to the seed and resources to make it bigger and more general. Thank you. Are you all there? Okay, thank you very much, Steve. That was impressive. Any very fast feedback, we don't have that much time. I need some time for my presentation, but that's impressive. Now, uh, why was I interested in, in talking to this in the context of uh, things, you know, that are very different that go to industry 4.0 is because only with the technologies like this that work and we have some of those already are we able to get where we need to be namely to uh, to go beyond technology 4.0 all right so that's that's my little point and let me try it and open some of my slides sharing screen okay are we sharing? We are not sharing. We are sharing now. Yes? Can you see my screen? Yes. Good. Yes. So, we are talking beyond Industry 4.0, but not too far. Some people improvise about Industry 5.0 or something. That's 
the story of the future. So Industry 4.0 is discussed very nicely by Boston Consulting Group. Uh, Bob went a little bit farther into in the, the fourth industrial revolution. I agree with Floridi that digital revolution in terms of uh, uh, scientific revolutions, it's really the evolution of industry 0.43 and 0.44, yes? So, and we have other uh, combinations. Various industrial revolutions are all based on new discoveries. And the new discovery was Turing's revolution. Now we are, however, getting to something advanced like Watson, like Dabus, like other things. And so actually industry 3.0 by my standards would be just introduction to industry 4.0, but 4.0 is what we have now. I think Steve and the number of people, including a couple in the room uh, are working within the future, are working with more advanced things still, okay? So I'm really running through things because I think Steve's presentation requires much uh, discussion. It's very, for me at least, at least uh, it's very interesting. But in order to go beyond Industry 4.0, which has many problems, it's big data. It's based on big data. It's based on augmented reality additive manufacturing, but also it is based on a number of imperfections where we need very strong uh, tech support, incompatibility, uh, viruses, things like that. So I think we need to go a little bit beyond Industry 4.0, but Industry 5.0, as politicians talk about it, is very interesting and charming and gives purpose to life, but is not based on any real on any real discoveries. So I'm rather really, really working on 4.5, which is exactly when we uh, become less precarious, the technology becomes less precarious and becomes a partner. I believe Dabus is one of those technologies when we are talking about a machine that is a partner, okay? I am butchering my, my own presentation because I believe there are many uh, moves towards economy 5.0, but we are still very far. So that would be Ben Gerzel, that would be definitely uh, Steve Thaler, that would be Siegelman's project with DARPA on lifelong le learning for AI. Now she is uh, acknowledging that that is still ahead of us in her earlier presentations, uh, Harvard Siegelman was, was talking as if uh, lifelong learning for AI was present. That's also David Kelly who is present in the room, but this is not, for, uh, uh, this is not uh, industry 5.0. This is going, which for me would be closer to AGI. This is just going beyond 4.2. And now I think is the time for me to finish. That was really short because Steve has done such a good job that I think we need the conversation. I would like Margojata to go first, Howard go second, and Rafa go third with questions and, commenta and commentators. They have five, seven minutes each, and then we have general discussion. Please, Małgorzata. Well, hello, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Małgorzata Marchewka. I represent um, Krakow University of Economics in uh, Poland. And I'm very grateful for this possibility to take part in, in the discussion. Uh, the things uh, that you are discussing are, um, I think, amazing uh, for people, especially for people who are not very into the details. 
And um, given uh, the academic level of uh, the previous speakers, um, who I really admire, the only thing that I can do is to ask questions. Uh, so uh, when uh, we talk about uh, constructing the systems, like in the case of Debus, uh, we observe um, some patterns that are specific for a human brain. We also try to illustrate we try to use it as a template, the, the patterns that we observe in human brain. So my question is um, th th some, some reflections on, um, is it a confirmation that we go uh, the right way? The fact that we observe the outcomes, the results that are similar to what we, um, what we can do as humans? Or um, is it like a, a starting point for something new, uh, for uh, going beyond these patterns? Um, maybe the point, uh, the, the point at which we are right now uh, should be a starting point for new systems that are not necessarily uh, reflecting uh, the uh, human brain with also with, with its limits, but going beyond the, this limit. So, so that's the first reflection, uh, I hope, uh, for, for the discussion. Mm. Let, me, let me try to tackle this, and this is, I understand, mostly to the presenters. Steve, we may go next, and then I let you continue. Uh, I would say the goal is not necessarily to imitate human brain. Uh, some people may care about it, but the goal is exactly to use the Baika philosophy, which is uh, biologic inspired cognitive architecture, as an inspiration for us in creating something great. Uh, in 2017, in Procedure Computer Science, an issue edited by uh, Alexei Samsonovich, I have a paper called Strong Semantic Computing, when I'm exactly advocating that point. We don't have to build uh, humans, we, we can do better with AI. Steve, would you like to take over the answer or do you skip on that? We need you to get to unmute, please. How about now? Yep, that was good. I keep coughing, so I'm trying to stay out of the, uh, the track. Sure. Um, no, I think we're going to go beyond uh, the human brain. And the reason is, well, I mean, just Davis currently uh, can accommodate uh, 10 trillion neurons. Uh, and I think it's uh, this whole idea of uh, uh, noise injection and retraction is key to uh, you know, building machines that can come up with brilliant ideas. Um, the downside, of course, is, well, maybe, and this is heretical to say that maybe we're not that wonderful. <laughs> You know, we all go around with the attitude, we're wonderful, but I, th I think it, uh, there is intelligence and consciousness all around, sort of a na Native American uh, naturalist uh, kind of interpretation of the world. But I think cognitions going on all around us, consciousness and sentience. Uh, so I, I think we have a lot to learn from these systems. And that was the original purpose of Davis is to understand it, let it self-organize. Good. But I don't mean to interrupt you. I just wanted us to have more on, of the discussion, but yeah, okay. Are you continuing, Steve? I don't mean to... No, I'm, I'm done. That's my two cents. We're Good. going beyond. Maugosata, another question? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so I'm happy that we are going to, to uh, break the barriers. Um, the, the next thing that is also interesting for me, uh, especially that I work in um, as psychologists in management, uh, is uh, Industry 4.0, 5.0, and the discussion whether we uh, can talk about uh, the next revolution or not. And um, I'm quite reluctant to use uh, this term, um, Industry 5.0. It took us ages to move from uh, the first to the second, from the second to the third uh, revolution. So why do we think that it uh, now it happens so quickly, especially that um, it doesn't, when we look at the theory of management, that's a natural consequence. If we are too technocratic, if we are focused on technology, natural reaction is um, 
sudden focus on, on human and the relation with, with people, uh, the, the society. So actually, it is like um, having the same revolution, but uh, from a different perspective. Um, can, can we think about this uh, this way? Thank you very much. I think this is something I tried to intimate to in my presentation, where talking about Floridi, who starts this fourth revolution in a very different cultural context with Alan Turing. And if we get that perspective, then, you know, the first part in the step for 3.0 was just very early stage. 4.0 is this nervous stage when we have many worries and try to control AI. And only 4.5 uh, becomes something really big. And I think Steve and a couple of other persons, at least a couple in the room, and not too many in the world, actually are already going beyond 4.0. Any burning question, Margozata, for the last one? Yes, the, the last uh, the last question. Uh, recently, I came across uh, an interesting study regarding the application of AI in um, the role of a manager. And there was an experiment how people, how team is going to react uh, when they are going to receive um, decisions from, from the system and from a, a real manager. And it turned out that uh, even though the decisions were the same because the real manager based on the decisions from the system, uh, the, the attitudes were completely different and people definitely preferred to work with um, uh, a, a real uh, manager. So I think that the, the, there is a new question. We are um, advancing technologies, the, the solutions, and what about the readiness of the society to, to cooperate with these um, technologies? Uh, how can we enhance uh, this readiness and openness uh, for um, the, the new revolution? Sorry for being snappy, but the first point would be not to call the human manager the real manager. Okay, so that would be a good start. Yes, this is exactly the difference between technology 4.0 and 4.5 for me, that with 4.0, yes, kind of like Tesla uh, goes, you know, self-guiding car goes to uh, the presentation, which is at the airport and trashes a jet because it wasn't trained on jets. Probably Dabus wouldn't have done that problem, but uh, that, that mistake, but Tesla is a car. It's not supposed to be, you know, a top computer. But I think as we see this kind of uh, cognitive architectures like Steve's, that is different. Steve? Well, you know, drawing from personal experience, I saw this happen way back in the mid nineties. I was proposing autonomous management systems and uh, usually uh, people were repelled by that whole idea. Um, so, I mean, that's a repeating pattern. You come up with an idea and mm -hmm. basically you've got to get big money behind you to make it go forward. And usually these are not the forward thinkers. I mean, they've got different talents, but they're not the uh, the mad scientists who are, you know, base, basically in the uh, the trenches, you know, coming up with new technology. So I think the the four point oh, the five point oh, are going to come a little bit slower than we thought. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Malgozata. Thank you. We enjoyed your questions, Howard. Would you like to go next? Yep. Let me get my video on. Dr. Okay. Hi, hi, Peter. It's you. nice to see you. And um, um, Stephen, it's it's uh, one sec. Let me just um, just everything here. Okay. Um, it, it, fascinating talk. So many ideas. Um, I would have liked to see a few more slides, Peter. But um, you know, certainly important topic. Um, and I, I guess I can give you my impression of the talks. Um, you know, Davis with um, Stephen. Um, it, it is just utterly amazing what you created, really um, utterly amazing um, system you put together and, you know, the, the output you've gotten out of it. Um, my impression of it, the um, besides being really amazed with the work, um, you know, I, I think with comparisons with the brain, you have to be careful. Like, for example, even, um, you know, um, if you speak to neuropharmacologists, you know, they might tell you that 
you know, the brain doesn't really work the way you're saying, like, for example, like, you know, the advertisements you see for medications such as like Zoloft, sertraline, um, you know, people say, oh, you have low serotonin, you need more serotonin, so you're not depressed. It doesn't, it, it almost certainly doesn't work that way. It's, it's working more upstream on the neuron, which is why it may take two weeks for the medication to work. Um, some, some of the other medications will work faster, like in your graph of the, um, the Goldilocks zone, for example, um, uh, methylphenidate for ADHD, it'll, um, or any in the amphetamine class, they'll, they will work immediately. And in fact, you do have that, you too low, people are apathetic, there's a Goldilocks spot, and too high, people um, can't function well, mainly because of anxiety. Um, but, but, and also other issues, like in terms, I think you, you um, in terms of the resonance of the, um, your multiple um, neural networks there, um, you know, it seems almost like, you know, you, it's, you know, um, what Singer, Singer, I think 1990s, um, he was an anesthesiologist with the binding problem by the resonance, you know, he, he showed that they were similar EGs and they were binding. And we actually do know that that may not be right. That's not how the binding occurs in the brain. But, but I'm just saying the, um, but brain's weird. But I mean, just like artificial neural networks, um, everything, deep learning, everything we use, um, you know, what's called neural network because was supposed to be based on the brain, but I, I think we realized the brain really doesn't work like that. But but I, I, I'm just saying in terms of those details, um, in, in terms, the big question I have though about it is, um, I see you did work um, like 2006, I think you showed a paper on music, like I said, it was a great presentation. Um, my, my big question is this, um, uh, neural networks, the equations were around since the 1980s, you know, 1990s, they were there, but it was, you know, became a nuclear, um, became a AI winter, AI winter, because, you know, the expert systems petered off, they didn't work, and neural networks weren't working. And then in 2010, um, you know, in Toronto, with grad students from Jeffrey Hinton's group, you know, they, they showed, hey, it does work, there's enough data, there's enough compute, and deep learning took off, and the last 10 years, it's just an amazing thing. Um, why why didn't Davis take off before then? Like, because you were doing things that neural networks weren't doing in 2006. I don't think, there, other than maybe some handwriting, neural networks really weren't working that well. Why wasn't Davis taking off then? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the well, it's taking off. It's a big success. But but neural networks has just changed. You know, um, you're talking hundreds, trillion dollar, trillions of dollars of investment. Um, it's used everywhere. You know, uh, Peter mentioned a Tesla self-driving car, neural networks in there for the self-driving. Why isn't Davis doing the self-driving in a Tesla car? Well, remember, we're not a large shop like that trillion dollar company. So okay. um, yeah, it's like, well, got to pay for patents and so forth. So got to do a lot of contract work. Uh, some intermediate patents uh, were created in, the, in that context. But uh, they were going on behind the scenes. And no, I, think I, I don't mean I don't care about the patents. I don't care about the business part. What I'm interested in is like, you know, um, in Hinton's group, 2010. You know, they used a convolutional net, and they they were able to recognize images, and they won the image net contest, right? And it took off. They had no Hinton wasn't that famous a professor. He didn't have a huge amount of funds. It was in Toronto, where funding is very modest. But people said, hey, this is a great idea, and then deep learning took off after that. Why didn't Davis take off in a bigger way? I, I mean, it's a huge success. Kudos to you for creating it. But why didn't why didn't it become as a big success, for example, as deep learning? I, I'm just curious from a technical. I, I don't care about the business or the politics. I'm just interested from the technical engineering point of view. Why didn't it? Why and didn't it get the success that deep learning gave? It was working at that time. Okay. It's just that you know, how do you convince people? Uh, who are not really uh, intimately associated with the technology, uh, how do you get them to invest? Uh, so it's more than just being an inventor or being a cognitive neuroscientist, it's getting the money for your ideas. Um, you know, I was aware of the problems at DARPA, you know, way back. And they gave me this, the same argument. Yeah, well, neural networks are not uh, delivering what they promise to deliver. I said, well, look at this. It was a creativity machine. Uh, one of those uh, uh, brainstorming neural networks that NASA's chief visionary, Dennis Bushnell, called the whole future of artificial intelligence. Of course, they poo-pooed that uh, and, uh, you know, said, well, here's, here's a paper recently published, uh, you know, <laughs> 
what did you have to do with that? And I said, well, nothing. They're basically a patent infringement. So what you hear is from government is we don't really care if we're infringing patents or even inducing. So it's it's more than just inventing. It's it's a personal battle to uh, you know, battle with the uh, the different media departments of these monster organizations and government, and just sponsoring competitions. Imagine, you know, we we live comfortably here. It's a lifestyle company, but to devote a whole year's worth of effort to pattern recognition uh, is beyond our capability. It's not that we haven't conceived the methodology. In fact, if you look at the patents, you'll see deep learning uh, 2008 going on and earlier 1998, it's all there. It's just that, well, we don't have a big enough uh, drum to beat to attract attention. Okay, so, but, but, but okay, I, I'm just curious from a technical point of view, like to try and understand like what advantage deep learning had over years, because I would think theoretically, um, the, you know, the capabilities I can get out of deep learning, I should be able in theory to get out of, well, from watching you talk for a half hour, what do I know? In, in theory, I should be able to get a lot of those things out of your system too. So I was just curious, not from a political or economic, but from a, from a theoretical point of view, why, you know, your system, you know, um, you know, wouldn't give the, the benefits that a deep learning system will give. It know, can, but, it yeah. can give the benefits of deep learning and more, and I think the starting point, the most uh, salient issue is that we're not architecting the system. We're not coming up with kernels. We're not uh, okay. you know, layering these networks uh, manually. It's all happening spontaneously. So the brain is building itself. And it's as though you're creating all these um, short lived uh, neural network, well, actually creativity machines uh, that can resurrect out of the clear blue or, or disappear. Um, so yeah, it's far beyond that. It's just that, well, no, uh, I'm a naive scientist, uh, mad scientist leaning toward mad. And <laughs> it's really hard. There, there are too many things that this technology can do and I don't have the investment. And having gone through due diligence a couple of times, yeah, these people are dead serious. They wanna know how much money they're making. And government harder and harder, and uh, you know you you uh, venture having a drink at dinner, and you know suddenly you've got auditors all over you. It's it's just a nightmare. So it's more a matter of not having the finances. It was all there. If somebody were to take the time to actually go through the patents that I have, they'll discover, yeah, dollar was there first. So, well, well sorry. Thank, thank you. I, I, I like the ideas. I really, I like the ideas. It was really a pleasure to watch your talk and I hope I see you at future, you know, future conferences and I learn more about the Davis system. Thanks, I Howard. Really watching it, yeah. Mm -hmm. Let and me, I guess let me take, Peter. let hmm? me, Howard, yeah, let yeah. me take a little bit of, of that point because since Steve is so much into the business of it, okay. the reason okay. why I, invited exactly Stephen was very happy uh, that he accepted my idea that was of course I rushed with my presentation but I will be publishing on it so that's not a problem mm -hmm. uh, the problem the thing is that this goes beyond the uh, industry 4.0 4 that was before its time and now the time is coming for many reasons the I, I teach students that there is Thaler's uh, cognitive architecture number one and number two. So if Steve, you call Dabus the whole thing from, you know, the last century, then it uh, makes the situation less clear because, you know, uh, randomly or not, Watson is very similar to uh, Steve's first cognitive architecture, but Dabus is way above that. And this is exactly what I called uh, you know, cognitive architectures going towards AGI. That, that actually I follow many people on this nomenclature, including Gertzen. So we are moving here beyond uh, industry for 4.0 and the natural time for this kind of cognitive architectures is that is right about now, which is why we can be moving Again, I don't believe that there is there are three different 
uh, revolutions. There is one Turing revolution, but we are moving to the more advanced part that uh, people were con uh, comfortable with even very recently. Does it sound okay? Um, sure, sure. It, it, it makes sense. I, I was, I, you'd have to ask Stephen, I was curious just from a technical point of view, because, you know, if something, the reason neural network, you know, deep learning was adopted, it works quite well for image recognition, then voice recognition. Um, you know, basically I've seen cartoons, you just stir in a whole pile of data, apply your linear equation, linear algebra equations, and you get an output and, you know, proved to be a successful model. It was started here in Toronto. Um, in a very poorly funded, you know, environment. Um, you know, it's, this isn't the United States. You don't have the funding here. It was like in a little corner of U of T. I think somebody took the video cards out of his, um, um, you know, out of his video, out of his PC or something. He was using video cards, like old video cards, you know, to get it going. Um, it, just to be aware, it wasn't big money that got it started. And I think the reason it took off and became you know, trillion dollar plus industry and part of economy 4.0 and economy 5.0, um, you know, you know, AI revolution is because people said, hey, this really works. So they they used it. And I would think Davis, I would think theoretically, you know, should work also. That's what that was the basis of my question, not so much for from business point of view or political, just, you know, um, you know. OK, like so let me another yeah. let me another short stab at this because I think Steve responded to this question, but it was also yeah. very fast. Uh, the point is controllability. In Economy 4.0, we mm -hmm. are all obsessed with controllability because we still don't know uh, the reliability of those cognitive engines. And in fact, rightfully so, as many examples show, as the economy becomes more entrenched and more reliable, then we, as a society, and this is also answering Malgozata's question that nobody addressed, you know, as a society, we become, we get reasons to be more trusting and therefore stochastic engines, you know, uh, uh, cognitive engines with strong stochastic elements are becoming much more uh, acceptable. And uh, Peter, I have, a I have a question for you once we'll switch, okay. to your, but I really enjoyed it. I, I was a treat. It was a pleasure to watch, um, you, you know, the, the talk about Davis, and I hope I hear f future talks about it. It was really a pleasure to listen to it. Uh, Peter, about your thing, again, I wish I would have seen more slides, but I, I really like the topic you're working on. <laughs> I have a question for you. Um, rather than, you know, you know, be historian and say, hey, this is what's going on. This is like, you know, describe what's going on in the landscape. You know, I, I would ask you, you know, uh, as more a scientist, ask you a question. Um, what what predictions can you make from what you know, like about, you know, for example, um, if, you know, in, you know, if, a, you know, the um, this is going to be like, you know, the fourth space, um, Facebook, which I think is now called Meta, you know, the they, they had the idea they're going to focus the company on the fourth space, so to speak. Um, everything's going to be virtual. And as a result, I, I don't follow stocks so much, but it's been in the news. The worth of the company gone, went down by half, by hundreds of billions of dollars, huge, huge amount. So, I mean, um, what prediction can you make about, um, um, you know, the Ford space or industry 4.0, 5.0? Um, what predictions can you make from your presentation? I'm just curious, what, in your, what in personally, what do you think, what prediction could you make from what you're talking about? Yes. Uh, industry 3.0 was good for Asimov. Machines okay. were stupid, therefore required strict control. Uh, 4.0 are good for those who are advocating transparent uh, computing so that we don't have uh, biases, we don't have uh, some kind of uh, too much autonomy to machines because they may rebel or they definitely they may malfunction. We don't okay. have interoperability. The most fun I had in a long time was, uh, you know, the AGI 2021, when uh, before keynotes, people were trying to uh, synchronize a very new and great mobile microphone with the rest and some of the top computer scientists in the world were not able to do it when 20 minutes 
uh, of conference and then after the break they get to do the same okay mm -hmm. but in the, in the current year i participate in the same conference they had no problems i think we are just getting through to what i call smooth sailing and this smooth sailing would be allowed by cognitive architectures kind of like steve's but also very well done but we have one more uh panelists rafa mm -hmm. thank you thank you thank you very much Carl. Yeah, yeah yeah i am here okay hello everybody yes. welcome great thank you peter great opportunity thank you very much because I know better um, work of Peter, great synthesis, synthesis he presented, uh, I asked a question uh, to Steve Taller, can I? Um, the question is simple. Uh, did you try to feed your system with uh, texts, with the uh, language products? Are you talking to me or? Yeah, 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 I'm talking to you. Maybe I... Oh, yeah, a, a, a lot of the training of Davis. And mind you, this is not back propagation uh, going on in a multi-layered neural network. It is essentially the capture in these associative memories. So it read a lot of technical literature, uh, in particular mine. Uh, and uh, also it went through phases like a, a child. Um, so, you know, basically you show it a picture of a chihuahua and that's a dog. Here's a greyhound. That's also a dog and so forth. So there was mentorship going on the same way a, an adult, a parent would do with a child. So there was quite a bit of textual data, but also there was binding going on because, I mean, here's a candle, uh, the word, and here's a candle in a picture. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we've also done experiments in which we have included olfaction, you know, here's the smell of a candle. So they all become bound together into these uh, associative gestalts. Um, they're all bound together. So, yeah, the text was there, but it bo was bound with the other information, too. And, uh, yeah, uh, the binding was going on uh, you, you based know, upon... <clears throat> Uh, let me explain what I wanted to say. Uh, the whole mechanism you presented was... Uh, I, I'm not very good at uh, cognitivis, cogn cognitivism. So for me, the, the crucial place is the place where your system connects to the reality, yes? And it, when, you when your system produ uh, produce uh, models, and uh, for example, can you produce models only for the language, meaningful language structures, which we can find in the text and build models only on the text? For example, like the embedded Our system? Well, the answer is yes, we can do it yes. uh, simply semantically, grammatically. Yes, um, and you can build, so so to say, uh, fully abstract models and structures which can represent uh, structures of meaning in text. Structures of what? Say again. Of meaning. Of meaning. Of meaning. Um, in text. For example, like embedded space, yes? When you can uh, try to build a model for the meaning of words in multi-dimensional uh, space of embedding. This is, this is the only way now to, to uh, uh, produce something like that, to, to change uh, the text into the structure, formal structure, yes? C can, you do, well, can your system do something similar? It can, but then we get into a philosophical discussion about meaning. Uh, I'm convinced that there is no absolute yeah, sure. meaning to anything in the world. It's simply a matter of cumulative 
exposure, and you see that in the consequence chains that form off of the uh, the, uh, the, uh, the concepts that are either being sensed or being imagined. So that's the so, sorry to interrupt. Problem. I'm giving a talk tomorrow about the grounding problem. I have a solution to it. Exactly. I have an exactly. engineering solution to it. Not <laughs> philosophical. I'm not so I'm an engineer. I have an engineering solution Good. tomorrow to it. Come, come listen to the talk. Oh, yes, an engineering oh, solution that's based on awful. what kind of procedure? That, sorry. Uh Howard before me, and I would have been a very good introduction because when we do what Lafo proposes we face simple grounding problem mm -hmm. and we mm -hmm. face uh, the problem of brains in a vat and we brand and service problem with chinese room so howard uh, you've got some extra audience yes for peter peter yes but good, let good, me good, let good, me good. say okay we can speak about it in theoretical mode and uh, trying to find something uh, a kind of reflection about it but now we deal with the practical solution. Steve Taller bring us the practical solution when what we can use in the real world. Yes. And my question is how to use this practical solution, this machine, to resolve the problem of meaning in language. This is and the question is, is it possible, like for example, uh, the solution comes to us with the embedding technique mm, in natural language processing. Uh, there is a analogy, similarity, or something like that, or this is something else. Can we use your models and structures to construct, for example, uh, text or uh, some like, uh, and use it in natural language processing? But of course, other way, but something similar. Well, the I answer is the... yes, we are doing that behind okay. the scenes. Um, but I guess uh -huh. the meaning basically is the number of these tendrils coming out. Uh, the uh, um, Remember I talked about uh, you know, the creation of self-classification you know, in terms of consequences. And uh, you know, basically it's like a plant taking root in the soil. In this case, the, the soil is the whole matrix of all of these uh, different uh, uh genre filters uh within the system so Rafa, and, and after that it's hab okay. habituation you know is it basically okay. the, well the, the question Rafa, mm -hmm. Rafa, Rafa, let me interject uh you see you see semantics as the primary uh meaning in this kind of computer science we view sub semantic uh, structures as more basic and but i think I, we need we, to move towards uh, paper tomorrow, and I need to give like five minutes, which is all we have. Okay, just also give me the, the last that. chance, okay? Okay. Give me the last chance, because I don't want to speak about <clears throat> semantics. I want to speak about knowledge, and this is the the second level. This is the higher level of of uh, uh, producing models, semantic models. Of course, it's semantics, but this is semantics, uh, advanced semantics. When we are talking about the knowledge, knowledge could be uh, about everything. Also, it can be expressed by the text. This is, and knowledge for example- And knowledge doesn't have to be about. Knowledge, knowledge can be off. If we okay, can suddenly this guru situation for, okay. uh, for okay. language, Doc has very big knowledge of what dogs do. Okay, let me open up to the, to the audience. Okay. Thank you, thank you, Rafa. Uh, anybody would want to ask the question? We have five minutes before uh, Armen's presentation. Anybody? Any questions, comments, interactions, disagreements? <laughs> okay. If not, I'm very happy that we had such a great conversation although that was a panel conversation. Howard, please remind us when do you speak tomorrow? And by the way, since you are thinking of it, my presentation tomorrow is exactly the same time as today, but I think in the smaller room and it follows up on the topic on the fourth space. Thank you Howard, very much. Howard, you're muted, by the way. You're trying to say something? Yes. 
Thank you. Yeah, 10 o'clock tomorrow. And, and again, I enjoyed very much being on the panel. Fascinating ideas. And I, I can just conclude with two things. Five years ago, you know, philosophy, I figured, ah, what effect is it going to have on the work I do? You know, je pense, donc je suis, who cares? And, you know, the last couple of years in developing my architecture, I've been hitting all the philosophical problems as engineering problems, like, um, you know, the binding, uh, I spent a lot of time on the binding problem, then I hit not only spatial, temporal binding problem, and then the grounding problem. And um, you don't necessarily, these problems arise, even if you're not dealing with language. Uh, Raphael, I would show you the, um, it, it's, it's a, the grounding problem, it's an engineering problem, and I really think future AI systems will all need to um, deal with these problems. You, you won't have a proper system without it which I demonstrate as best I can tomorrow in 15 minutes. But anyway, okay, it was a great something? panel, thank you. Just in the end, because um, I produced the theory about mm -hmm. the uh, about the uh, language and the knowledge in language mm -hmm. based on the idea of the set of the um, entities which make the trajectories in the multidimensional space. And this is the, the model of the knowledge. And I'm trying to find the real base uh, of the uh, and the idea how to uh, re rebuild yes the language to find the formal more formal structure we can we can we can use in for example mathematics and and this is the ground of my question yes I, I still don't understand how it going on when you can take uh, the language as a, from the real life, yes, the, the structure of text, and to uh, change it to uh, structural models uh, in doubles. I maybe I Rafael, should find something more, but thank. But very, I think that this is very, very, very interesting. And thank you very much. I would be looking for. Thank you very and much. And thank you for your last point. Let me mention. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was participating at the uh, sales conference uh, by, I don't know, the uh, AGI conference. And now, paraconsistency of those models is very visible also in language. Uh, so that's why, when we want to have the holy grail of semantics, that's a problem. And now I think Randy and Armen are taking the floor. We are two minutes in short for some kind of change of thing. And thank you very much, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye, thanks everyone. Thank you, it was a pleasure. Likewise. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Thanks, Peter. Yes, Felix. The floor is yours.